All right, I put this uh, first. So this is, uh, you know, I, this is more for the naturalists that are associated with, you know, mammals or birds in particular, because those are the, and, and herps, you know, uh, reptiles, et, et cetera. So, you know, this is kind of like this mentality of, well, if you find something, it may not look great, and it may not smell great, but we can learn a lot from it, you know? And so, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the mentality of, you know, why we have these specimens up here and, and what they can actually tell us. And, and this used to be kind of the bread and butter for mammalogy naturalists um, to go out and discover biodiversity and to then pull in series of specimens and compare them and begin to, you know, basically understand more about your environment. And so I'm, you know, a member of the American Society of Mammalogists and you know, back in uh, whenever it was, 2007, I think, we hosted the meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so this was kind of our little souvenir that we gave everybody. And then there were mammalogists all over America sporting this, sporting this bumper sticker. And there's still one or two out there. But I really, you know, I keep a cooler in the back of my car and some bags. You know, Jill is uh, one of the best specimens in the last few years, um, brought me a, a newly dead badger. And you know, badgers are not common and even less common to see one. So to get a good fresh one, you know, provides us so much material. And part of what I do actually is not just to do research on the mammals, but also on their associated biodiversity. I'm not, not just talking about like the plants that they eat, if they're herbivores or, you know, the other species that may be in the same area. But the obligate associates, and there's lots of them. So there's parasites on the outside, there's parasites on the inside. A lot of those parasites on the outside carry diseases that hurt humans. And so, you know, understanding those kinds of connections is um, my bread and butter. And so, you know, for instance, those badgers, uh, I've had two badgers in the last year, were both packed full of parasites. And that, that provides us a lot of information about different components of biodiversity and about different habitat associations and things like that. So, you know, I just want to plug this because I actively accept donations. <laughs> so, you know, and it doesn't need to be fresh. Fresh is always nice. Um, and, you know, unbroken is always nice. But, you know, I use every part of these specimens. So I'll talk a little bit about that, hopefully, as I go through. Anyway, that's my plug. Um, uh -oh. Okay, so yes, um, I am here at K-State. I've been here since 2014. Uh, let's see, I was a research assistant professor for about four years, and then I got hired in a tenure track position. So I'm midway through my, my tenure track right now. Um, I actually started in Glasgow in Scotland. I'm half Scottish. My mom's American. I lost the accent. Um, and then came over here uh, to New Mexico shortly thereafter um, to do my master's in Portales, which is on the Llano Estacado out in the High Plains. Uh, yep, Texas Tech, uh, right down the road. Um, and then I did my PhD at the University of New Mexico. And uh, I was there for seven years. And I worked in the museum there for all seven of those years and three years during my master's. I've been associated with these kinds of biological resources for 25 years now. So, uh, you know, I, this is really my bread and butter. Um, and, you know, I go out to the field every year to try and bring in more resources. And, you know, I might ask, you know, why do we, why do, we do this? You know, why do we have, why do we have these kinds of collections? I mean, anybody? On the hazard. You know, this this is all first of all, how many species are here? I guess one. It is just one species, but if you actually look closer, um, there's lots of morphological variability. And oftentimes that morphological variability is is uh, congruent with geography. So you know you can see how species change. Um, in space. But not only that, 
you can see how they change through time too. So, you know, these are all fairly recent and they're all from basically the Great Plains from North Dakota, South through Texas. Um, but you can go back to museum collections and look for the same species from the same places. And sometimes you have good time series. And so you can actually show that there, there's turnover um, in the populations that are occurring in a given area. Um, and that turnover can be caused by many different things. Um, it can be caused by climate change, for instance, generally speaking, the warming trend, things are shifting northwards. So you might have a turnover in the same species between one form or one genetic lineage and another that moves in thereafter. Um, or you might have go back to a place where all the bees were caught 50 years or 100 years later, and they're not there anymore. Um, and that happens a lot too. And so there's turnover in the different kinds of species that are there. You might go back to a place where you were caught, and it's a parking lot for a shopping mall, you know, and that happens a lot too. And, and so, you know, the, the whole concept of change and understanding that through time is a big reason of why these are useful. Um, but not only that, just understanding the biodiversity in itself, understanding those connections, whether they're obligate connections or, you know, passive connections. Um, and so, you know, the other thing that we're all thinking about right now is disease, uh, and we are mammals, and that predisposes us to all of the other diseases that mammals carry. You know, um, bats are getting a bad rap right now for COVID, and rightly so, there's enormous amounts of sort of evidence, strong evidence that bats harbor many, many different kinds of coronavirus. They also harbor all sorts of other viruses and bacterial diseases and things like that. Um, so by having these samples, you know, you can go back to museums and um, pull samples from 50, 100 years ago and test those for disease. And you might be able to locate when diseases first arrive in a given area or figure out when the disease is mutated and changed to a form that's then more, you know, virulent and things like that. So disease research is actually a huge um, component of all this. But anyway, we're talking about naturalists. I just wanted to kind of set the scene. Um, so you know, I'm I'm into discovery, and you may think, well, mammals are mammals. We know everything there is to know about mammals. Uh, you know, that's not true. We're still discovering new mammal species all the time. Oftentimes, they're species that look like other species. Um, but sometimes they're, you know, completely new and, and morphologically different too. So, you know, discovery is still a big part of this. Um, and sometimes those discoveries come through understanding the associations and go, well, that's got a different association than I would have expected. Let's look in a little deeper. So you go, you go pull a little piece of tissue on that, sequence the DNA, compare it, and figure out that it's actually wildly different an evolutionary standpoint. And so a lot of the of observational stuff of being a naturalist um, tends to point us in the right direction to look a little further with, with uh, modern methods, which are um, really coming to the forefront now. So natural history, you know, uh, I consider that a, a mainstay of all this, um, even when it comes to the, the kind of um, the mainstream science that I do. Um, I'm associated with museums. I'm an evolutionary biologist but my major focus is conservation of biodiversity. And that's also a little bit of a paradox here when you think about these specimens. Why am I going out and killing all these things? You know, it's for conservation of the same species. And so, you know, you have to have a, an objective viewpoint of all of these things and their natural history of these species. Um, these, I basically consider most of these species as renewable resources. They turn over very, very quickly. Um, there's no way that a scientist is ever going to have an impact anything like even remotely close to a bad storm or a plow or, you know, a tr you know uh, roadworks or anything like that. So the good outweighs the, you know, the bad. Terms of that. But also, as I said, I collect dead things just to make use of them. So, anyway, on we go. Um, 
So a broad overview for today, I have traps set outside. I picked up half of them um, and I have a few animals and a few different species. And I have a few more in, in, on, on the ground. So we can have a, a go at actually um, collecting some of these and seeing how we actually do this. Then we're gonna walk around a little bit and look for various different mammal signs. It's actually kind of nice when it burns like this because it exposes all of the, um, it exposes all of the fresh sign on the ground that isn't destroyed by the fire. Are they actually burning there? I think so. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It looks like they're going down. Yeah. All right. I noticed so they're, they're burning with the neighbors. The neighbors are okay. burning. All right. Um, we should be all right. I've had a whole trap line burned in the past, not here on Pondo, but elsewhere. So you just get that timing right. If you threw the whole plot, you're fine. Yeah, and a little bit right next to it. So. I think they're done with all that. Okay, anyway, um, trapping, we're going to go outside. Then we're going to come in and actually, instead of natural history, we're going to be here about the history of naturalists a little bit. And I think that's kind of important because our mentality now is a product of our actions in the past. And so understanding how we got here, I think is insightful. Um, and it's kind of interesting too. So, you know, the, the practice of being a natural historian was very much developed over the past couple hundred years. And we still maintain with mammalogy many of the methods that they were developing in the late 1800s. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk about natural history of mammals, different methods for observing mammals. I might've switched this around. It's been five years since I did this talk and I've changed it a little bit, but there's still some of the past stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about mammals at risk in Kansas, and we can have discussions as much as you want about, you know, the various issues involved with human wildlife interactions, you know, because I'm actually teaching wildlife management right now, and human wildlife, wildlife quote unquote conflict um, is a big Not only it's human human conflict about wildlife, there's a lot there. So, um, maybe we gloss over it, maybe we spend some time there. And then to finish up this morning, I, you know, I really want to encourage you to come up and see the diversity of mammals. Uh, what I've got here is a selection of mammals from the Great Plains for the most part. Um, so most of these species you can find right here in Kansas somewhere. Um, there's about a dozen species that are real common here on Kanza. And then there's a whole slew of other species that you'll find elsewhere in the state. Um, and so I have little tricks to know how to identify most of these things. And, you know, this is a big part of being a naturalist is to go out and you find something on the ground and try and figure out what it is and then put that into context. Um, and if you don't know what it is, or you can't figure it out, then it's harder to figure it into context. So um, we'll finish off by just trying to brush up on your mammal ideas. All right. Uh, so. Methods for observing mammals. This is this is a lot different than ornithology, and you know ornithology is is kind of a daytime sport, where you can go out and you know with your with your binox or with your tape recorder or your ears simply and, and realize the diversity of birds there, uh, apart from you know some species that are a little more elusive. Mammals are much more elusive, generally speaking, and you know it's interesting. It goes to follow that. The ones that you see are the ones that you know best. And so um, all of the diurnal species or the daytime mammals are the ones you're most likely most familiar with. Um, and then some of the bigger ones, this is a baby coyote, for instance, you know, everybody knows coyotes, everybody knows raccoons, these are nocturnal, but you know, um, they're common. So and also the natural history of the species. But when it comes to the little guys out there, um, you know, I find that most people don't even realize that they're out there. You know, these tiny things, this is a blurina or a short, short-tailed shrew. Um, and this is one of the most common mammals here on Kanza in some years. They cycle in their populations. Um, but when they're common, boy, they're everywhere. And yet I have never in my life seen, seen one running around. Actually, no, not true. One time in my backyard, I managed to grab it actually. Um, but, but normally you never see these things. And yet they're the most common components out there of the vertebrate communities. 
Um, so, you know, instead we have to use surrogate methods to realize the mammal biodiversity. And so, you know, a lot of the species out there use latrine stations. And um, this is a part of their behavior. So the vole species, for instance, um, right here, uh, prairie voles or meadow voles will always poop in the same area and build these little piles. Um, and uh, the reasons for that may be signaling, you know, maybe just being tidy, any number of different things. Of course, you know, we can use other components of vertebrate biodiversity to understand other components. So this is owl pellets, obviously, are actually a wealth of information. Um, and so, for instance, you know, it used to be that everybody thought that these tiny little shrews here, um, when they're alive, they smell real bad. And everybody thought that they basically, nobody would eat these things. And then, you know, in certain instances, you started finding certain owl species where the pellets were just packed full of them. It's just like, well, in a given area, if food is scarce, um, then they'll switch over and make use of them. Um, or in a given area, you know, they may have adapted to monopolize on the, that species, even though we don't normally consider that to be the case. And so this is real, like, kind of discovery and inference from this kind of sign. Um, this is a pack rat midden. I'm going to show you one of these out in the Hulbert box. And most of you are probably familiar with these. Um, these are the pack rats right here, you know, um, and they'll occupy these middens one at a time. So one male or one female with their family. Um, when they die, they'll be inherited. I don't know if they're actually inherited linearly by sibling or, you know, family, but I think it's basically first come, first serve um, type of thing. So these are multi-generational structures that actually kind of protect these species against various or external conditions in general. Tracks are another great way. And so, you know, go down to the Kansas River and there's a wealth of information there, not just about mammals, but also uh, the turtles and the birds and all of that stuff. And, you know, we've got beavers all over. Um, they can be destructive, but they at the same time are ecosystem engineers. And so this destruction that we consider is actually um, beneficial to whole communities of other species. Um, and, you know, we all find bones all over the place. It's actually a 50 pence piece. So this must be British, just my guess. Um, this is a cannon bone. So, you know, understanding your anatomy, um, this is like the long leg bone. It's actually a fusion of, of some of the foot bones, foot and lower leg bones to help them run fast. Um, I'm going to show you some of these. These are actually runways. So certain species, like these voles again, uh, like to actually follow the same tracks all the time. They're, they're like little mazes out there. Um, and then other species, like the paramiscus mice, which I've got a whole, a whole tray of over here, you know, these will basically just go straight across and wherever they want. Um, and so understanding the different kind of life histories of these different species, you can begin to infer which species you've got. And then if it's out in the prairie, if it's out in relatively dry prairie like we have here, then it's most likely a prairie bull. If it's out in wet prairie, um, then it's most likely a meadow bull. Um, and so the same genus, but different species occupying different habitats, but with the same kind of life history. Uh, so, you know, Placement, as well as what you, you know, the sign that it is, as well as where you are in the world, as well as what time of year it is, or things like that. Oftentimes, what will happen, you'll get these rays running waves like this after it snows, because they come up to the interface of the ground and the snow, and they're actually on top of the ground at that point, but still underground. It's weird. So when the <laughs> snow melts, you get all of these basically risen pathways all along the ground um, and often gophers will do that. So, you know, you're, you're all familiar with these dirt mounds, <coughs> but maybe not familiar with what causes them exactly. Um, they could be pocket gophers, but they could also equally be moles here. We have both. Um, and so telling the difference between moles and pocket gophers is actually not trivial. Any of you know? You mean by looking at the mound? Yeah. I know my mind is the moles are all connected. So yeah, so this is this is moles. They're they're much more connected like this in linear kind of fashion. Um, there's another way you can tell like if the mole is if the hill is basically like a volcano, 
and the hole's right in the middle. If you pull the dirt aside and the hole's coming out of the middle, then it's a mold. Whereas pocket gophers, you know, will dig up at an angle and push all the dirt over to the side and then cover up the hole last. So the holes are the side. Um, you know, the other thing is that uh, their natural history is so wildly different. And yet the sign that we see is so similar. This is a pocket gopher, this is a mole. This is an insectivore. It eats worms and arthropods um, and won't go near plant material. This is why I actually, in some ways, don't even mind having them around my garden. I mean, worms are also good for the garden, but I do know that these aren't going to actually destroy any of my plants. They may even aerate it. Um, these, however, are herbivores and they're plant material as opposed to seeds. And so, you know, you go up into the mountains in Colorado um, and you have these mountain meadows there, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. What maintains those? You know, it's this species or the species that's up in those meadows that actually maintain those, which provide habitat for the elk, the grapes, um, and provide, therefore, you know, uh, food for the wolf and things like that. So, when you say maintain it, do you raise it below ground? Yeah, they're root eaters. And so, um, most of these, you know, the early successional um, woodland up there is like Aspen, for instance. Um, and so, that'll encroach in on these meadows. They're underground, basically eating away at the roots of the aspen because they're they're um, plentiful and full of sugars, and kind of maintain these meadow habitats. So you know, these are the connections, and understanding them um, through this kind of sign can tell you a lot about where you are and the health, quote unquote, health of that area. All right. Anyway. Um, the biggest thing we do in order to understand mammals, because after all, the small mammals are the largest component of the mammalian communities, we just don't see those because generally speaking, they're nocturnal. Um, some exceptions are chipmunks, for instance, or squirrels, all of the sayurids, and I've got some of those over here too. Um, instead, I work with small mammals for the most part, I use traps. Um, I don't have one of my box traps, but I'll show you when we get out there. Um, we have live traps. Um, where we can catch stuff and then mark it and then release it so we can track populations through time. Um, I also extensively use kill traps because after all, these species carry diseases um, and they can be dangerous. If you get bit by these, you know, you can get pretty beat up sometimes. So kill traps actually make it so that we don't have to deal with that process and then we can use the specimens thereafter without worry of, of, you know, being bitten or transferring diseases. Um, I also have a bunch of other kinds. These are mostly kill traps, but these are for subterranean things here. So there's a whole uh, selection of different kinds of mold traps and gopher traps. So you can try your hand at that. Just try not to take your hand off when you're using them or skewered because those can be tricky and strong. All right. So, okay. So before I get into my lecture, we're gonna go outside and, and do some trapping. It's a beautiful day. It's meant to be up close to 80 today or something. Um, so I had 80 traps set last night of live traps. Um, so we're gonna go out and look at some live animals and then release them today. I'm just basically doing a show and tell. Um, I, I'm not gonna take any data, so you know uh, I won't worry about uh, pencils or anything marking them. But basically, when we go out, we set lines of traps um, from a naturalist point of view. Generally speaking, we do this opportunistically. We go out with a big bag of traps and then just set this meandering line of traps to try and maximize the different habitats that we're sampling from under bushes, out in the open, um, forested areas, grassland areas. Check your traps, um, measure the animals, identify the animals mark them often with an ear tag so they've got a nice earring on thanks joe um and then release them or alternatively what i do is i'll take them back to the lab where we sit in a circle and i think i've got a picture of this and process the specimens for the rest of the day and we break these things down into all of their constituent parts we take the ectoparasites we comb these guys for their fleas and ticks and lice and mites and we preserve those um, to study disease or, you know, biodiversity of um, parasites. Um, we then do all of the body measurements. We then open them up. 
take the organs out and we freeze those. Those go into um, liquid nitrogen or a minus 80 freezer, super cold. You all know about that now because vaccines. Um, and they stay frozen in perpetuity, theoretically for 100 years or more. Um, and then we can take pieces of those for genetic analyses or testing for diseases or using stable isotope analysis to figure out what they were eating. I take the guts out, cut them open, and look for parasites on the inside, tapeworms, roundworms, flatworms, um, and then preserve those in ethanol too. And then the skeletons get cleaned off and we stuff the skin. So it's literally every part. I, the trash can is just full of paper waste. There's no like body parts that go into it pretty much. So that's my philosophy. It's like, if I'm gonna take something off of the land, I'm gonna make sure that it lasts. My lab, well, that's me. But these are some of the folks from my lab, not all of them. And in fact, three out of these four folks are undergraduates. So they're, you know, they, what an experience to get out and do this. I mean, it's not, not only that, but we're camping out, you know? I mean, people don't do that that much anymore. And, and uh, you know, the diversity down in Southern Texas of small mammals. <coughs> There's a little bit of overlap with here, but there's a lot of different stuff too. So. Uh, did you meet the director of the Lunar Exposure? No, I met the main biologist. Who was it? I can't remember her name. Uh, it, she, she was she was the um, not the Jaguar Rindy, but the uh, oh oh my. Uh, what's that endangered cat down there? Ocelot. She was the Ocelot. Um, I could have much. Wait, you just know a bunch of the people in that whole series. It's a cool area. Yeah. Boy, it's like wildly different than anything I used to. Are we all here? No, I'm just seeing Leslie. Okay. Leslie and Ken. They're all in the room. What are they? They're all in the room. The 8.15 animals. Talking to the room. Oh, for God's sake. They'll never be here. They'll never be here. They'll never be here. They'll never be here. So, yeah, you, I guess you're going to have to get the cane. Yeah, I'm getting sick. You're begging. Right. Yeah, so, well, first of all, that's one of the few species, that mouse, that occurs down in southern Texas. Um, it's a very wide ranging species. I don't know much. Of, what, what do you mean? I don't have a year. I'll have to go look that up, but. Um, my guess is it was caught relatively close. So, you know, these most of these species have kind of a home range. Um, and yet when they're young, they'll disperse and find a new range. So some of the things that you put ear tags in, you never see again because they just happen to be passing through at the time. And then other things, you'll catch them right next to their hole and you'll just catch them over and over and over again. And so that one most likely, you know, surely does live there. Um, so anyway, all right. So that was a success. That was a great success. Shoot. Yay. <laughs> I know. Yay. And then it's always, it's like human nature. You love to see things, little things scampering out. All right. So should I? Carry on. You can carry on. I just need to let people in. All right. So mammal, mammal natural history. Let's see. Uh, there's different kinds of science, right? Basic or science where we're trying to answer questions about form and function and all these things for the purpose of answering those questions. And then we have applied science which is science that we perform, which can also be experimental and high level science um, in order to achieve uh, some sort of applied application. So like wildlife management is all applied science. Whereas like, you know, evolutionary research on disease or molecular biology is largely fundamental science. Um, and then we have observational science, um, which some people kind of do do a little bit. It's just like, well, this is not, hypothesis driven and a rigorous framework. But this is the backbone of natural history. And I think it's still a critically important element of science. This is what um, many of the agencies do um, is go out and record data and keep long-term records of wildlife populations. And this is really the heart of natural history, I think, 
Um, so even though it's an observational science, it's critically important. And you know, the whole point to me of natural history is to develop conceptual linkages um, and understand the real linkages between biodiversity and their environments. And so you know, you go to a museum like this and you see these dioramas or whatever, um, and they have species that are there in their natural habitat and these big vistas and everything. Rarely see most of these species in these dioramas. These are all the big species, the charismatic megafauna um, that we're used to seeing. But still, when we do this for museums, for the general public, we are basically recreating their ecology and their natural history. And that's so, you know, this is inherent. We can relate to this. Um, you know, not only their habitat associations, but also their community associations, and then their different life history strategies. So, for instance, elk are out on the plains. It certainly used to be, but also up in the forests, and, and etc. So, we can begin to kind of make predictions about what species occur where based on um, the more knowledge that we have of any kind of association, um, the better our predictions are. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, natural historians, we're paying attention to detail and we're making a record of those observations. And I'll tell you something else, more and more, we're disseminating those records. If you just put them on a shelf and they get lost in the mists of time, then that knowledge is lost. And so, you know, um, part of the deal with museums is that every single thing that's associated with these specimens, including the field notes, of the trip that they were on belongs to the museum. It's an archive of material that um, persevere as we drift by. You know, we are short lived as opposed to these specimens. And I'll get more at that. So, you know, really recording is important, and, but also getting that information out there. All right. So, I'm going to go through hopefully a, a brief history of mammalogy in North America. And I'm very biased here because I'm a mammalogist and proud. But in my estimation, some of the earliest kind of development of conceptual how we go about being natural historians was by mammalogists. Um, and the reason for that, again, is because we are mammals and we can relate to mammals. So the ornithologists and the mammalogists, those are the two kind of big groups of things. So the history of mammalogy in North America kind of started in the late 1800s with a discovery. This is when we were basically colonizing the West um, as the white man, you know, arrive and, you know, explore and conquer. Um, and so, you know, really it was kind of these philanthropists largely who go out there, um, often U.S. Army Medical Corps people um, would go out and then the Bureau of uh, uh, I've got it on the next slide, and then just catch things and preserve them and describe them. We didn't even know what was there to begin with. So this was this phase, and we still do that today, again, because we can get an example of how things have changed since the late 1800s by continuing to do that. So E.W. Nelson was an early um, explorer, essentially, and he went out on a field trip one day down in Mexico, and he came back 14 years later. So talk about a field trip. I go out for a summer, one to three months of continuous time, and that's longer than almost anybody else these days. And yet, you know, back then, this was, you know, this was a way of life. Um, and he back collections that are in Smithsonian and other things. Um, so, you know, this was the discovery phase, natural history phase in the early 1900s, really going out there, catching things in given environments and then relating them to those environments, relating them to their location. And then they take these specimens back to the museums and look at large series and compare the morphology um, and begin to describe them in terms of their relationship to other closely related species and also their taxonomy, so naming them you know, so that we can um, put a name to the face, essentially. Um, also recording intricate notes on their habitat association and also on their biogeography. So, you know, are they associated with plains in the South or plains in the North? Same habitat, different 
geography. Um, so, you know, these are all important things. Seahart Merriam is a pretty famous name, um, and he was also a manologist. He started out with a division of economic ornithology um, because birds were really important back there as game species. So they were an economically important set of species. Um, so um, economic ornithology um, and mammalogy, um, which was a federal, uh, this was back in the days where we basically managed wildlife for our own purposes because they were worth something. They were for profit. Um, in 1905, economic ornithology and mammalogy became the Bureau of the Biological Survey, which is the precursor to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey. So this was the earliest phase of these federal agencies that are still doing this today. Um, in 1919, Marion founded the American Society of Anologists. So he was literally one of the founding members. Um, and you know, we just literally had our 100th anniversary, well, last year, two years ago. So, so this is kind of a cool thing and it's a good time thing. So the, his, one of his statements was key to advancing systematics or knowledge, in other words, um, of the mammals and what they're related, how they're related to one another is to obtain and study large series of uniformly prepared specimens. So this is it. Um, this is the, the methodologies that were developed by him. Um, and there's other players in here. This is one of the field trips out to the West um, back roughly the same time period. So this one here, this is Marion here. Um, that's Vernon Bailey, which is another famous name. This is their field crew. Today, this would be me and my students going out. And this, you know, so this is really kind of the wild west. There was nobody else out there, really, you know, just some uh, fur trappers and, uh, you know, Native American people. So Vernon Bailey, I'm going to come back to. He's another big name. And that's uh, Hart Merriam. Anybody else? Anybody know what else Merriam was famous for? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, but it was a different Merriam. <laughs> yeah. No. You're. It's, it's. That's a great answer. Um, you know, this is Merriam's life zones. So he. This is natural history in its essence, really, because this is um, our understanding of. Uh, habitats and their relationship to latitude and longitude and aspect and all of these other things. And so he's putting the pieces here. Um, you may guess where this is based on the labels I put in here. This is Arizona. And so he basically described these life zones in Arizona because you go all the way from desert scrub in a snoring desert down by Phoenix up to um, alpine tundra in Flagstaff area, San Francisco peaks, down to um, desert scrub again, the Grand Canyon to the north. And as you pass along the transect, you go through all of these different ecological zones of dis distinct habitat types that whole communities of mammals are associated with. And then there's a certain amount of overlap there between these different communities depending on how tight those zones are and everything else. The north side of the mountains has a lower zone because it gets less heat, it's less arid, you know? So they're not just straight across, they're kind of like this. And that gets more extreme when you go up. So, you know, this is a conceptual basis that actually we're probably all familiar with at this point. But back then, this is brand new. And what we're finding now with change is what happens when climate moves. Um, yeah, everything shifts up slope. It can shift north too, but if it can't shift north because the intervening habitat is already too harsh, then all it can do is shift up. And if it keeps shifting up, then eventually this disappears and then this disappears and all of the communities associated with it. All right, so, so this is conceptually a, a really important set of uh, observations. Anyway, that was Merriam, a mammalogist. These are the San Francisco peaks. This is a beautiful area. I don't know if you've ever spent any time out here. It starts down here in the Ponderosa Pine. Um, this is uh, maybe Doug Fir. Um, then it goes into the mixed conifer zone, and then it goes up into the spruce fir forest, and then finally up on Humphreys here. It's 
There's no, no vegetation virtually at all. Um, but you know, there's mammals up there. Uh, so, so this is a really good example of his work. And so, you know, there's this long litany of old white men, you know, that kind of led the field here. And, and I talked about them the last time I did this talk, and I, I neglected to include one of the most important people of all in all of this, um, which is Annie Alexander, um, uh, a tough woman. Uh, and she was basically a philanthropist who went all over the West. Um, because she had the money to do so and she had the connection. Um, she knew Hart Marion and she would go up to Alaska on these big collecting and observing trips and bring back specimens for museums and everything like that. And she eventually, in the early 1900s, she lived in California and she promoted and founded the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley University, which is one of the largest museums in the world. Um, and then she wanted to be the first curator of that. So Annie Alexander was a formidable um, precursor to modern mammalogy. Uh, and so she's part of this. So she hired this guy, Joseph Grinnell. You might have heard of the Grinnellian niche or something like that, if you're an ecologist. Um, that was him too, which basically you know, associates species with their habitat space. Um, and so he was the first curator of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, also an explorer, spent years up in Alaska. He was actually started out as an ornithologist and then turned over to mammalogy because obviously it's way better. Uh, <laughs> there's a few of them that have done that. I'm sure there's plenty that have gone the other direction too. Um, anyway, you know, this is the ethic here that I've been getting at. You know, I'll just read through it. Um, this is a state when he first started this value will not have to be realized until the last of many years, possibly a century, assuming that our material is safely preserved. And this is that the student of the future, which is all of us, um, will have access to the original records of farm conditions wherever we are. All right. So this is the ethos. Uh, that really is, in my mind, the backbone of natural history is that we can't understand what's happening now out of context with what's gone before. And so, you know, these resources allow us to do that. Uh, it's, this is foresight and very um, insightful. So, you know, he went all over California in the 1900s and sampled mammals on transects up the mountains, just like Miriam described. Um, and in 2000s, 100 years later, according to this kind of like statement, they went back out and sampled the same exact places. And the reason they could is because his field notes were so intricately detailed that they could go back to the same exact places, even without GPS units, take the pictures from the same exact aspects and everything, collect more specimens. And what they found was that mammals there, communities had changed very significantly in just a hundred years. You know, the, the bummer of it is, is that there's absolutely no records from anywhere in the middle of those hundred, that hundred year time period. So, you know, the great kind of industrial revolution was when? Well, I mean, the, 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 the modern one, the modern one. So uh, it, it, I can't remember what it's called. It's called the great something or other. But anyway, roughly in the 1950s and 60s was when the modern kind of changes in global environments and global climates really began to ramp up and go into this exponential phase of change. And yet there's no records from that period in these areas. So, you know, it really gets at um, time series and being rigorous about your collections. So this was an example of his field notes and, oh, I forgot to bring some. I, I, last time I brought my own field notes because my format for field notes is exactly the same as this. Um, it is a standardized format where you've got your own specimen number. This Depotomies, which is this species right here, was the 6,565th specimen that he processed. Um, and it's got that, and it's also got its mass, its sex, its body measurements. It's got detailed locality information. The dating was collected. 
And then there's a bunch of text to describe the habitats, the other species that were caught there, etc. This is a wealth of information. Um, this is somebody else's field notes, but sometimes there's cool diagrams showing pertinent features, um, uh, different all, all sorts of different stuff. You name it. Uh, and you know, in my field notes, I write what we had for dinner that night because 50 years from now, we're going to be probably eating different things too. But you know, it's just like it's a record of your life during that period, um, including what you got. So, you know, Grinnell was basically the Grinnellian niche. So environmental conditions limit a species distribution, all right? So they're limited by lots of things, but mostly they're in some way or form related to their environment, whether or not that's because there's a uh, competitive species there at the same time, which ex excludes them from a given area or their climate tolerances or any number of things. Um, and the Grinnellian method is the method that mammalogists use to this day. This is him out in the field. And I've got a picture here in a second. I'll show you us doing the same thing. He's got spools of thread here, which he sews the mammal specimens up with. This is a hole, like we were just working with. Um, they weren't collecting the guts and the parasites and the tissue because genetics didn't exist back then. And coevolution didn't exist back then. You know, but they would store these mammals and so they'd skim them out and save the skeletons, which are dried skeletons here, um, and stuff the skins with cotton and sew them up. Um, and they do this out in the field. So that they went out in all summer and did this. Um, Kansas, I don't know if you know this, but Kansas is actually a hub of mammalogy. I mean, Eugene Raymond Hall is one of the most famous mammalogists in the world, and he was at KU for many years. Um, he built the museum there, and the KU Mammal Museum is also one of the largest in the world. Um, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't done too much in recent times, but an academic sister of mine was just hired as the new curator there, so she's going to be kind of picking that up. So Hall was a big name. We have a Choate student in here. Uh, Jerry Choke was the mammalogist who built the um, Sternberg Museum out of Fort Hayes. Um, and so this, this is just like iconic mammalogy from, you know, a few decades ago in Kansas. You know, they'd go out with a shotgun and just like collect specimens and bring them back to the museum. You know, this is the short grass prairie around Hayes. Um, and, you know, this is how we gather this information, but he was a, a consummate natural historian. He knew these habitats. He knew if he was in a given area, which species would occur there and how to find them. Um, fortunately, he's not here anymore, but uh, fortunate enough to get to know Jerry a little bit um, back in the day. So, so here's today. This is Caleb Meacham here. Same thing. And this may seem a little bit gruesome to you, and I apologize if it does, but, um, you know, that is that. That's the same rabbit specimen, all right? So Kaylee went out to Cinderella National Grassland with me this last year and a bunch of other folks from my lab and um, had a, you know, very good shot, which means that these animals don't suffer at all, you know, and we try and reduce that. And it may seem a little gruesome, but you know, here's the rub. This specimen and its value to science will likely outlive Kaylee, you know. Um, and certainly uh, it's intended to be preserved to last at least a couple of centuries um, in these collections. So this is information, and I might add the rabbits are um, in decline throughout the West. Um, the jackrabbits have not been doing well. I don't know if you heard, there's a new virus that's sweeping through rabbit populations right now. It came from old world rabbits, which are the domesticated kind. Um, and it's a bad variant of this virus that has been around for a few decades. Um, and it kills all rabbits in this country. And so, you know, it's a hemorrhagic fever virus. Um, and all of these things are prone to it. It's now in New Mexico, it's heading eastwards. So, you know, we actually went out there and got these specimens last year of um, not just pack, not just the uh, jackrabbits, but also cottontails from the same place, um, which is this specimen came from there too. Um, and, you know, we hit it 
before this disease comes through. So we have preliminary data now, so that when it does, we may be able to understand how that disease works um, by going out and continuing to get samples. And of course, we have um, frozen tissues, we have all the parasites associated with this and everything else. And again, not just that, but if you want to become a natural historian, think of the experience that she had out there, you know, <clears throat> learning all of these associations, living it rough, getting dirty, um, using a different trap types. This is my lab here out doing what G Grinnell was doing, sitting at a table, basically processing mammal specimens. Um, this is a different site. This is Lovewell Reservoir up in North Central Kansas here. Um, and everybody's involved. And this group of people now has a skill set that is going away. Not that many people can do this anymore. Not that many people are actually making those connections. So, so they're actually dissecting the animals right there. They sure are. <coughs> um, this, is, this is our field lab right here. So what we do is we, we come back from checking our traps, and then we triage the specimens. And some of them will preserve in ethanol. Ethanol is a really good preservative. We don't use formalin because formalin eats DNA. Um, the Russians have been using, using ethanol for centuries, and those specimens are still fine for genetics. Um, so we'll put some in ethanol and then others will process. And so, you know, um, I'm sitting here, I'm doing the internal parasites. Lisa is the data keeper. She takes a specimen, measures it, IDs it, sexes it, passes it to um, Kaylee, which takes the ectoparasites, plays and takes some lice and mites. She then passes the specimen over to Tommy, who opens it up and uh, takes out the tissues. And then passes it to him, and he takes out the intestines, or passes it to me. Um, I take out the intestines and go through them for the endoparasites, and then give the carcass to Tommy and his skin and stuffs it. So this is like manufacturer line. We're making burgers out. It's not quite McDonald's, but it's the same kind of idea. And you know, this publication, we actually just formalized this. So we're keeping this spirit alive of getting these methods standardized so that everybody's on the right page, the same page at least. Right is relative, but at least we're all doing the same thing in rigorous manner. And, you know, we, we published this, you know, in the hundredth year of the Society of Mammalogies. And, you know, this kind of outlines the whole process that we go through. So again, nothing's wasted. Um, whoa, where am I going? Okay. So this is kind of how, this is my lineage. And it's just, this is just history, so it's interesting. So Annie Alexander started the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, hired Joseph Grinnell. Joseph Grinnell, one of his first students was Raymond Hall, who came out here to Kansas and started up the KU Museum. One of, Ken, one of Hall's first and, well, certainly best students was E. Lendl Cochran. I couldn't find a picture of him, um, who wrote the Mammals of Kansas. Um, so, you know, a big figure. He graduated his PhD, moved out to Arizona, and then one of his PhD students was Robert Baker, who went and founded the Texas Tech Museum. All right. Um, one of his first students was Perry Yates, who was the guy who eventually brought me over from Scotland. I was searching for a place to go, and he says, come on over, I'll give you a hundred bucks a week and a place to stay. And, you know, that was it. I lived out in that field station for 15 months. So he was really the guy who got me involved at this point. He was at the Museum of Southwestern Biology in New Mexico. One of his first students was Joe Cook, who was my advisor, and here's me. So this is an actual lineage all the way back down from the start of mammalogy, um, which is cool. I, you know, it's, I, I'm not boasting or anything. It's just nice to see those, see the, the progression. And this is this is my lot. So you know this this kind of academic family tree is generally speaking go through doctoral lineages. Um, and so the master's students tend to get lost, which is unfortunate because um, the master's level endpoint is still so important. Those are many of the land managers that are out there on the landscape. Um, I don't have any PhD students at the moment, so you know. These won't be officially my lineage, but at the same time, this is my heritage. Um, and it's uh, it's a pretty good group. They're like a family. Anyway, um, okay, I'm getting through it. Sorry, uh, hopefully this is all 
interesting to you all. I want to I want to go back to some field notes here, and it's, this is Vernon Bailey. This was the guy uh, that strapping young man right there um, who wrote the mammals of New Mexico. Um, so he spent a lot of time discovering mammals in the West. So this is the essence, in my view, of natural history. I have to come out here and read this because it's not it's not easy. What he did was he wrote an account of the environment in Nevada when he was out there in poetry form and included all of the species that he saw, all of the habitat associations, and it's just absolutely phenomenal. So, oh, let's see. The eve had left, wait, the sun had left the mountaintops, the valley shrouded lay, and I was hunting dipodops, which is now in micro dipodops, at the break of day, at the close of day. Twas in, twas on the wild Nevada plains, a cool November eve, and the number of animals I saw you never would believe. So he's got the timing of it, he's got the place of it, he's got the time, you know, it's like the season and everything. Some were only common kinds and not the best, uh, some were only common kinds and not the least bit rare, more which you'd count the cottontail and the black Texas, black-tailed Texas hare, all right, which are the two species I just showed you there. Um, Tamius Prietus, which is now something different, frisks about and climbs the sagebrush tall. His brother Lucurus never climbs, so never gets a fall. All right, so these are two different kinds of ground squirrels. One's a chipmunk that lives in sagebrush. Another is a ground squirrel that doesn't, you know, it's like, it's real. And then he's got diagrams of these dipodops. This is its leaping footprint, and this is its foraging. The feet are closer together, it's dragging its tail. There's its front feet, there's some little digs where it dug up some seeds. I mean, this is the essence of natural history. It goes on. I can't help, I can't help it, so. All right, so number five. The momies, pocket gopher, plows the valley o'er and eats the farmer's crops. So does Hesperomys and the little dipodops. Hesperomys is the old word for paramiscus, which is the mouse that. All right, the grasshopper of the plains is sweet to the nicomies, which are grasshopper mice. Um, among the bushes by the brook, you'll find the evodonies. I'm gonna come back to this one. Two kinds of perignathus, which are pocket mice right there, live in the sandy hollow. Colotus finds a shady place and makes nice paths to follow. So it's kind of like the bulls or the, all right. Sorex, which are the shrews, is the least of all and loves the damp, dark soil where juicy bugs and fat blind worms um, repay his lonely toil. Just out, just at eve, coyotes howl and scare the black-tailed deer. If you could see these animals, you'd think the sight was queer. Whoa, that's just amazing. So the cool thing about this is that the votamines, which is right here, which is the red bat bulb, doesn't occur there anymore. Um, Sorex doesn't really occur there anymore. So, you know, this is history. And this is observations that we can then compare to the future. Um, I am not a poet, but boy, it would be nice. Um, anyway. Okay, so we talked about habitat associations a little bit. Um, and, you know, the mammals that I'm showing you now are all Kansas mammals. There's way more than you think there are. I think there's like 50 something species in the state, maybe more than that. Do you know? I can't remember. Um, and that's nothing compared to arthropods or birds, even. Um, but, you know, it's still a fairly big diversity that you don't often think about. And so, you have woodland areas, and traditionally those are the eastern third of Kansas, even the eastern quarter of Kansas. And those woodlands are spreading now um, for various different reasons, uh, cessation of fire, land conversion, um, climate change, all of these other things. Um, they tend to follow the waterways first and then spread out. And along with them come these communities, which were much more limited in the past. Um, so you have white-tailed deer, that might, is that a mule deer? Um, it's a white tail, yeah. So um, I'm actually working on a project right now about deer hybridization between white tail and mule deer. So who knows? 
86. What? 86. 86 mammals. So I, I thank you. Way more than I thought. Um, I should know that. Uh, so, you know, as a naturalist, you go to an area and you kind of got to ask yourself, um, is it reasonable to suggest that mammals actually inhabit every single habitat? Yeah, generally speaking, that's the default. And you go, okay, so what species would occur in that habitat? Um, depending on, or I'm talking about micro habitats. So within woodland, you've got so many different kinds of things. You can have species that are up in the trees, squirrels, um, for instance, flying squirrels as well, um, which I've got here. Um, in the bushes, some species live, you know, um, skunks, for instance, love that brushy habitat. Um, in the leaf litter, um, certain kinds of shrews, particularly these short tailed shrews that I was talking about, they love, they live in the duck layer, either in grasslands or in woodlands. Um, at the forest edge, rabbits tend to monopolize that edge habitat because it has a nice lush green grass right next to cover. So, you know, there's a number of other species that like those edge habitats. Um, there's subterranean species. And, you know, generally speaking, you'll get the moles kind of in woodland or open areas, but more so in woodland because the open prairies in Kansas tend to be more arid. Um, and so uh, they don't hold as many invertebrates like worms and stuff, which the moles need. So the moles tend to be where the soil is wet, or at least uh, not, not saturated, but, you know, fairly easy. Um, daytime or nighttime, that's a big thing. So diurnal mammals, you know, are the ones we can relate to. We've got woodchucks here. We've got tree squirrels. Um, we've got some that are crepuscular, like the rabbits, which are dawn and dusk. Um, and the deer are also kind of dawn and dusk all through the night. Um, and then you have nocturnal forms, which are uh, the voles and the mice and the possums, et cetera. Um, near water um, is another big one. So certain species are obligately associated with riparian areas. And these riparian areas are normally associated with some kind of bosque forest, such as the, the gallery oak, the bur oak forest here, or the cottonwood gallery forest along the river two very different forest types associated with water. Um, it's the vegetation underneath that the meadow jumping mouse likes, or the western jumping mouse, two different species that you can find here. So, you know, even though there's this community associated with woodland, really they're all associated with their own little part of woodland. And some, some of these do interact with one another, but it's not so much mammal mammal interaction as mammals interacting with other groups of species. And so really this is where the naturalists come in because naturalists are by definition, I would say well-rounded, you know? You have this, this is why we're taking this course because you have all of the different aspects of it. And really, if you wanna understand the associations of these mammal species, you can't just be a mammalogist um, because you know, the, those aren't necessarily the interactions. Now there's some super cool interactions between mammals. Um, for instance, um, closely related species might be ecologically similar. And so competition is a really big issue for them. Closely related species might be genetically similar and so can interbreed with one another and hybridize. Um, and that has vast consequences for the future integrity of those species. Um, and so, Mammal-mammal interactions are still important, but really this is kind of about these habitat associations. Um, tall grass prairie, here we are. Um, so there's, these are the main players. These are these, these are cotton rats, and they're a big boom bust species. This, this is a cool species actually. Um, this is one of the largest small mammals around here. You know how long this thing lives? Yes, throw it out there. 20. 20 years? 18 months. Less. Less and less and less. Six to eight months. That's it. And in that time, it's born, it pumps out two or three litters and dies. This is about as ephemeral as it gets for an animal of this size. I mean, and so you kind of, 
I use this in, as an example because it's further, you know, evidence that life is, you know, pretty tenacious for these guys. And certainly what I'm doing is not really having all that big impact on it. But they can really boom bust. As soon as it gets really wet years, they go through the roof and they become the most common species on the landscape. And then they'll just disappear. And so the question then is, where is that source? Where are they holding it up until the next wet season? And if you can find those areas, then you better believe they're long-term uh, rigorous wetlands, most likely. Um, so that's this species. So it's, you know, it's associated with music habitat. But again, it's the same thing, whether you're looking at bushes or the open prairie. Um, this is a deer mouse, which is the sister species of the white footed mouse, and that's the grassland. They look almost identical. Um, in the leaf litter, you know, you've got various other species like the, the two shrew species here. Um, you've got bog lemmings, which are found in the really wet, swampy areas around. So, like, you know, this is kind of a cool association because Ducks Unlimited, which is a huge um, nonprofit organization, throws a lot of money into wetland recreations, which helps a whole suite of different mammal species that they have absolutely no idea about. Um, so I go up to these, you know, um, refurbished wetlands, and you find bog lemmings and, and storax shrews, a different kind of shrew, and meadow voles, and a whole suite of species that just wouldn't be there. And our wetlands in this country are not doing so well. So um, anyway, and then you've got, you know, I guess maybe you're looking at all these going forward. They all look the same. But, you know, there's slight differences. Um, you're all familiar with the foxes. There's red foxes here, but there's also gray foxes. There's swift foxes out in the grasslands of the west, um, kick foxes. And then you've got the wood rats here that are often associated with woody habitats, but are in prairie associated habitats too. And they're super diverse. Um, there's two different, there's three different species of wood rats right here. And, you know, so when you're up here, See if you can figure out what are the features that I would use to tell these apart. This is when it starts to be like, if you're not out there doing it a lot, then it's difficult, you know. But you have to kind of develop an eye for these different features of the different species. Um, and then there's different kinds of gophers and different kinds of habitats. And then, you know, we got short grass steppe. So this would be Western Kansas. And you've got 13 line ground squirrels, which you actually get here too. And they occur all the way up to, I was catching them in, in uh, North Dakota a couple of years ago. Um, and they're really numerous up there. Um, so they've got a big range through the plain. Th these are the species that have these broad distributions through the Great Plains. Uh, and so generally speaking, the Western part of the Great Plains Whereas the species on the previous slide were more of the central Great Plains or the more productive tall grass prairies. So very different communities. All right, you recognize any of these? Porcupines out in the short grass prairie? That's odd, but boy, they are. Um, I, I just wanna, I, I gotta say something about porcupines. They are the most underappreciated species in terms of their adaptability. Um, they occur in virtually every single habitat that there is. You'll find them in cotton, way up in cottonwood trees along the Rio Grande. You'll find them at the border of Arctic tundra in northern Alaska. Uh, you know, you'll find them out in the ponder, pinion, pinion juniper woodlands in the arid desert of eastern New Mexico, out in the prairies. Uh, it's just phenomenal that this enormous species, which is right here, watch your fingers, um, because these are spiky. Um, this big species of rodents is so adaptable, but it's a very, it's a cool species. There we go. All right, not so many of these around anymore, but that's, that's an issue. Um, I don't think it needs to be an issue, but it is. Um, not so many of these, not so many of these. This one? Black footed parrots. I'm going to come back to this one in a second. So where are the armadillos? Oh, shoot. Good call. Um, you tell me. They're here. Where? Where? I saw one here on Henry 24. 
Yeah, I did too. I like yeah, Abilene, Texas. No, Abilene, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where, wait, where's that? Uh, That's 30, 30 miles that way. All right, yeah, of course. I, I'm still learning my state. I was, I was there actually last year. I just get confused. All right, so actually, it's a good topic. They are one of the um, biggest indicators of progressive environmental change. Um, they are a South American origin species, um, armadillos. They're one of the few species of South American mammals that have crossed that interchange and have persisted up here in North America. There used to be a whole suite of other ones like ground sloths and things like that. Um, so they have warm affinities. They're very cold and tolerant. And so they literally will not occur where the winters are too harsh. It'll just kill them. And yet they are moving north really, really fast. It's actually like you can track them. And I just reviewed a paper from a bunch of mammalogists up in Nebraska that were talking about armadillos in southern Nebraska just recently. And they were all male. And so they don't actually call them resident because I guess it's the males that go out and then expand their range, you know, and then the females come along afterwards. But um, that's the leading edge now is southern Nebraska, and that's brand new. Um, they're moving on a decadal basis. Javelina out in the west or another species like that, where they're moving further and further north. They're north of I-40 now. So um, yeah, that's a cool species because it's a great indicator that climate now is much warmer on average than it used to be. Um, and I forgot it. But they're actually associated with a whole range of different habitats. They like it best um, at the interface kind of, of the Great Plains and the Eastern forests. But they also will occur out in the plains too. They're grubbers. And so they'll go through, they, they'll eat a broad range of things. I actually do have an on the oil, I forgot. All right, so check out their skull. Um, because you can see that their, their skulls are so adapted to, you know, the tiny little peg teeth. And that's, a, that's an evolutionary constraint in their history. That whole group is, is edentate, you know, basically they kind of suddenly lost their teeth. Um, so check out this skull there. I actually don't really know everything that Anzgillas need. Um, these are desert specialists, kangaroo rats. Um, they're granivores. They don't drink. And so they get all of their moisture from their seeds. And so if you have these as a pet, don't feed them cracked seeds because they'll die. They need the actual metabolic moisture from those seeds to be able to persist. They're just given, I mean, they can drink, they just don't need to. Um, this is a, a much smaller relative, a little silky populus. I've got one of these here. This is an adult. This is what they look like. All right, tiny little things, also seed eaters. And so, you know, there's a great diversity. Here's the grasshopper mouse, which is the wolf of the rodent world, highly carnivorous. Um, I had one of these as a pet and I just feed it crickets and they'd like bite them once and then just hoard them in the corner of the cage and eat them later. Um, vicious, but very cool animals. And then, you know, so this is kind of the Great Plains community. Long tail weasels. All right. Okay, so let's talk, I'm, I'm winding up here. Let's talk uh, briefly about some of the mammal species at risk in Kansas. Um, I did just mention black-tailed prairie dog and black-footed ferret. So there's issues with these, and there have been for a long time. Um, and it's normally a people-people issue as opposed to, you know, well, it's, it's considered a direct issue, but the evidence as to how much they actually harm grazing or cattle or all this um, versus the uh, emerging evidence of the benefits of having these things around is kind of making this whole argument a little bit more difficult to swallow. Um, but anyway, it's still a contentious issue. There's no doubt about it. And you know, they are reintroducing black-footed ferrets now in Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico. And I think they're trying to, I know Ron Capacity is trying to um, promote that in Kansas also. Um, Why not? You know, I mean, these aren't, aren't really doing anything. The problem is that they require such an enormous food base that it's almost unfeasible. 
And you have to get people on your side because the habitat that prairie dogs require to support the very small population of, uh, of uh, black-footed ferrets is in the thousands to tens of thousands of acres, all right? So this is an ongoing issue. Um, the other issues here is that this will die if it gets canine distempered. Um, it sweeps through ferret populations and kills them all. Um, and so domesticated animals, again, dogs, um, don't have a good outlet for this. Interestingly, COVID affects weasels pretty badly. Um, and so they are actually going and vaccinating the weasel, the black-footed ferrets for COVID. Uh, and so there's all sorts of issues, but it's not just with the ferrets. Disease hits these guys too. Plague can sweep through a prairie dog colony of a hundred or a couple hundred thousand individuals, and they'll drop down to dozens of individuals. And when that happens, there's just not enough food. And so the kinds of natural hurdles that we have to deal with in this kind of situation, let alone the anthropogenic ones, are almost insurmountable. But that said, a lot of the focus on these reintroduction or restoration efforts is about the connections. What are the disease connections? How do we, how do we mitigate that? What are the habitat needs? How do we make sure that we have them? And so, you know, the knowledge that honestly we don't have enough of as natural historians is, is the ecology of it, you know? So that's the important part. You know, what are the solutions? I don't know if you have any good solutions to this kind of conflict. Any thoughts? I mean, you have land out there. I mean, it's, it's a, it, prairie dogs are, I mean, you, I can. Well, I mean, our place in Colorado, we have a prairie dog right, right there. And some of the complaints they come in the vacuum, using the vacuum out of the hole and move somewhere else. Yeah. And those, it was, there was, Huge prairie dog colony there around the Chatfield Drug Court. Yeah. But well, I never saw a ferret. Right. Well, that's what they're elusive. So they thought they were extinct. And then they actually found one colony and somebody just spotted one. And it was on private land, it was on ranchers' land. And they actually um, reported it and brought out um, federal biologists to, and they caught them all and started the captive breeding program. I think it was. They had a dozen individuals to start with, or eight individuals, and all of them died from canine distemper. And then they managed to catch the rest of the individuals and keep them isolated. And from those, I think it was like a dozen or something like that, is every single black footed ferret that, that's here today. All right, so, uh, you know, some of the solutions though, it's like you gotta find ways to, to positively interact human to human. So that's really, so the social, aspects of this are really, really important. How can we have a conversation with landowners about how this can benefit them, you know? Um, people will pay a lot of money to go and have a chance to glimpse one of these things. And so ecotourism is actually a very real option. Um, of course, you may need infrastructure, you may not want to deal with that, but you know, that, there's a lot of talk about that. Um, you know, subsidies, you know, resting land every once in a while, or breaking back the fences and stuff like that. Um, and, and having some kind of subsidy system that will compensate landowners for supporting this kind of effort. Um, uh, those aren't the only answers, but. Wyoming, the device, and to, uh, oh, boy. So an 800 miles. Yeah, the subsidy. The subsidy programs for wildlife in general are, are yeah, vast. And, and it's case, case specific. So, you know, there's a lot of subsidies for altering fences, for helping things get through. Uh, Pronghorn will jump over, they'll go under and sometimes through the fence. So, in the wintertime, you know, even if you raise the lower wire and there's lots of snow there, and they get stuck. And so, you know, it's convinced people to just put a panel in or a gate which they can throw it down because they pull all their cattle off in the wintertime anyway. So open up your fences in the wintertime type thing. Uh, it, yeah, we could talk about this for hours in terms of our interaction. And here's, here's the bottom line here is that human beings, unless we get wiped out by some deed, are just gonna continue 
to increase. And so this interface between urban and even rural um, humans and wildlife is going to become more and more pressing and more and more of an issue. And so these are the issues that we really need to start focusing on, is the, the human issue. I was just going to say you know, that in my department, in the state, I'm about the same joke, but you know, just because we are you know, professors with a liberal agenda that we are. Down the of our right. Um, you know, we, we extrapolated even further to say, you know, to do all these things that we know we want to do that are good for the environment, good for the communities, for the interactions with the environment. We also have to recognize things that make people desperate in their lives that cause them not to want to do the things we need them to do. So, I mean, like, it, it's even as much as like thinking about healthcare access and housing access and you know so that people are not living paycheck to paycheck and once you can get people a little bit more secure then you can start to do these things better so again you know liberal agenda but um all of these you know, good things that we want to do we tell our students like keep registering to vote and understanding that all of these bigger issues that you're voting on actually directly impact our professional ability to do what we need to do it's all the time yeah sure it is that's, I mean, such a great point. And that comes into it again. This is the human dimension. And the human dimensions of wildlife are, you know, is, is really the future. Um, and yeah, I've been talking about philanthropists by definition, you know, people who actually are able to do this because they have the means. Uh, and we're lucky for that. But at the same time, if we want to actually make progress, then we need to facilitate all of society. Be able to do that too. So yeah, that's a it's a that's a tough one. Uh, you know, the other thing we have too is modern technology. I don't know if any of you heard this story. Well, maybe because that's it's less than two months old. Um, in the end of twenty, or it's less than less than a year old. In the end of twenty twenty, they actually cloned the first black footed ferret. Now this is another contentious issue, right? Um, and they called it Elizabeth Ann, which is a pet, big pet peeve of mine, anthropomorphizing animals. It's like, oh, don't, don't name wildlife. But, but this is the thing, it's like, this is how you get the public to relate to it. So every little thing helps, and I'll take it. Um, but the point I want to make here is that they cloned this individual, Elizabeth Ann, from an individual specimen that was in a frozen tissue bank in a museum that was 30 years old. So they, the tissue, the DNA from that tissue sample was pre-collapse of black-footed ferrets, which means that it holds the genetic variability that the modern population doesn't have because of the severe inbreeding. And so they clone this individual, which has way, way more genetic variability than all of the rest of those ferrets put together. And then it can breed with those individuals and remix. It was called like, you know, it's classic hybrid bigger, outbreeding. Um, and so that's a cool story because not only is it mixing in new technology, but it's using specimens for things that when they were collected, there was absolutely no inkling that they might be valuable for those things. And so, you know, this is the future questions, and this is a really good case in point. Um, and so we'll see, of course, um, the specimen that this was cloned from was called Willa. So isn't this Willa? <laughs> I don't know. That, and so it gets into a lot of ethical issues in terms of, you know, what are we doing now with science that we have the capability to do? Um, uh, we're walking closer to Jurassic Park than people might think. We are. And, you know, everybody wants to bring back mammoths. And, uh, you know, I think we should focus on the species that are almost gone, as opposed to the ones that are gone, um, and try and bring those back first. But, you know, this is, this is a whole new world now. I was going to make one more point. I'd forgotten it. Um, but uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Um, other issues, oh yeah, involved with this is, we don't know what the impacts are gonna be. If it was an old individual, 
that this was cloned from. Like Dolly the sheep, for instance, was cloned from an old sheep and it died really young. And the reason it died really young was something that we didn't have a clue about back then. You know, it's the telomeres on your chromosomes that tend to erode with age. Maybe, I mean, that's the theory now. And so, you know, there's lots of things that we won't be able to answer about this until we see how it plays out. So the question then is, do we let it play out? You know, so I don't know, it's food for thought. I certainly don't have the answers, but it's a crazy new world. Okay, another group of species that's not doing so well, I haven't talked a lot about. I used to work with bats a lot and I don't anymore. One of the main reasons I don't is because it's extremely difficult, difficult to work with bats. Um, and this is another issue that I have because just at the time where bats are actually starting to have really, really serious issues. And because of those issues, um, there's big moratoriums being slapped on doing any work on them. Uh, you know, in my point of view, this is exactly the time where we should be increasing the work on these groups. But there's a, a philosophy out there that a hands-off approach is better for the animal. And this plays into what I was just talking about. And there's no easy answer to this. So bats are being heavily influenced by white nose syndrome now. Have you all heard of this? All right, so white nose syndrome, white nose is a fungus. This is literally a fungus that grows on these things. Um, and this fungus thrives in caves that are moist and cool and standard temperature. And of course, half of the bats, at least that we deal with are cave dwelling bats that spend at least part of the year in caves. And particularly the ones that hibernate in these caves um, go to sleep and don't wake up until it's too late. They get infected by this fungus and then they look like this called white nose syndrome because it manifests around the face, but it also has lesions on the wings and things like that. And you know, these bats are, some of them are dropping down to like, again, you know, dozens of individuals in a colony that used to be tens of thousands strong. So it's, it's like a big killer. And, you know, the Great Plains here where we sit is an ecological filter in my point of view for biodiversity between East and West. There's forests in the East, there's forests in the West and not much can actually get across that. Um, but as we fragment the Great Plains, we make this filter leaky and communities mix. And so we are actually building bridges between biodiversity from East and West. The limit of white nose syndrome is right here as of five years ago. Now it's west of here. Um, they found it in North Central Texas and it popped up in Seattle, Washington. And now it's in the Western bats and it's gonna sweep through them. And the they think that it was actually possibly bat biologists that brought this thing or cavers because people come from all over the world to Missouri to go caving and then bring their dirty boots back home um, and then there it is. So th this is another interesting story here I'm going on, but um, they went and checked specimens in Europe from museums that were hundreds of years old and they found white nose syndrome fungus on these specimens. Um, so they established that this illness is Eurasian in origin and it arrived here in North America and they actually have a point to plus or minus five years of the place and the timing of when it arrived and has quickly swept through all of the bats in the East that are associated with these sy symptoms. Now, the question is, are any of these species gonna go extinct or are they gonna drop right down to a really small population of resistant individuals that then bounce back? Or, you know, they'll go extinct and something else will evolve to fill their niche. You know, so it's not necessarily the end, but, um, they don't like people touching bats now. Um, and that can be good or bad. You know, biologists are known to spread things around and that's bad. Another issue is like the clean energy deal. It's hard to say that trying to promote clean energy is a bad thing. But, you know, these wind farms out there, there's different ecologies of bats. So these little ones that tend to live in caves have shorter, broader wings, more maneuverable. They fly around within forests and locally. Um, the ones that are associated with tree bark and stuff, like the hori bat, are longer, narrow wings, high, fast flyers, 
and they fly out in the open and eat the big moths up high. And so these are the species that are being affected by wind turbines. So they're not getting white nose syndrome, but they're getting hacked up by the blades. And, you know, so there's so many problems everywhere we turn, there's another problem. Yeah, so it's it's kind of hard to... That's because their radar does no blades coming in from the side. It's too fast, yeah. I mean, if you actually time the tip of one of those blades from 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock when it's windy, and then you consider, I mean, the span of one of those blades is longer than this room. So how will something that big get all the way around the speed it's going at? Nothing can move. Yeah. Nothing can get out of the way. And so it's a big deal with birds too. So there's solutions here, but you got to get people on board. There's cutout speeds, you know what that is? They'll actually cut these things off at a certain wind speed. Um, and that wind speed is pretty darn low. They'll keep them going even in a nice slow wind. If they just upped that cutout speed to where it was windy, then the bats wouldn't be flying anyway because it's too windy. And yet that's the profit margin. So, you know, and so the other thing is they could cut out these things at night and then the bats wouldn't be affected by it. But of course the birds would still have that problem. So there are solutions almost always, but realizing those solutions is, uh, well, it's another, it's another issue. Um, this is a big one and this is natural history. So, um, Anybody know what species this is? Mexican pretail bats. These are the ones that can be tens of thousands to a colony. Sometimes 10 million, I think, some, some of the colonies are down in Texas. Um, yeah, and Houston and over further west too. Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico is one of the largest. It's the most famous one, but it's not the largest. Um, Big Bend area, I think, has another. Anyway. These eat more arthropods in a single night than you could possibly believe. I don't have the figures, but it's tonnage, serious tonnage of biomass. And, you know, they focus on the ones that we don't like, like mosquitoes and things like that. Um, these are cave dwellers, and they all live in the West where there's no white nose syndrome yet. So if these guys get wiped out or even brought down to a fraction of their population sizes, then all of a sudden the ecosystem service that they provide to us through reducing arthropod levels to manageable levels is gone. And you know, so this, there's all sorts of unknowns associated with this. All right, yes, I'll gloss over this. This is another one, this is about agriculture because agriculture, if you look at agricultural maps of the Great Plains from uh, less than a century ago, um, they were tiny little holdings, fields were small, and each field had an edge, either a hedgerow or an intermediate old field edge. And this is exactly the habitat that these skunks like, is the messy intermediate habitats. And then agricultural change to industrial agriculture, where basically you take down all the intermediate fences, and then your fields are just enormous monocultures, and so you lose the available habitat for this species. Might, might have ring, ring for that too. Yeah, so pheasants are a big deal uh, here in Western Kansas. There's a lot of money pumped into those. And of course, there's lots of small mammals out there. Um, this is cool because I actually caught all four of these. These are all species in need of conservation or SINC species for the state of Kansas. So there's the bog lemming right there. Um, and this is the first specimen from Kansas I got last summer in over a decade, I think. Um, Southern flying squirrel, this is the first time this has been seen in southeastern Kansas in over 50 years. Um, and one of my graduate students found this specimen in an oak tree down in uh, Cherokee County, right in the very corner of the state. Um, spotted ground squirrels are only really found in the Red Hills and the Cimarron grassland area down in the southwest. This is a very common species in New Mexico, but here in Kansas, it's very rare. Um, and, you know, we managed to pick up some specimens. So again, one specimen, one specimen, one specimen, you know, these are value 
here. And then, you know, this is a full disk harvest mouse, um, which, which I also have here. It only occurs right down in the very south and southwest of Kansas. So it's another species of concern. So the KDWPT actually gave me money, not very much, but some to investigate the small mammal communities around Kansas. Uh, so they're on board with this. Just, um, it's not their top priority, I'll tell you that. Okay, so um, again, I'm finishing up. But this is, what can we do? Public education, I talked about that a bit. Become nat naturalist. And again, observe, always observe. Record, that's important. And people get lazy. And then they, those notes just get taken away in a closet. So, you know, donate, the, donate your observations to a museum. They'll take them, you better believe it. Um, and then, you know, my job is to advance, advance science um, and to continue sampling um, and training the next generation. So, you know, here's a bunch of possums that somebody donated to me to make sure that they got into a museum and we're going through them here in my lab. All right, that's it. Um, so this is, anybody know what this is? Vicious thing this is. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the size scale, which is difficult. Um, yeah, it's even smaller than a mouse. It's actually, it's actually a mole. So its skull is only like this big. <laughs> but you can see these teeth are just crazy. I mean, this thing is a carnival and it eats mostly earthworms. But uh, anyway, you know, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.